once again, thank you for everyone that has uh, listened to Khan and me over this series. We both have enjoyed putting this content together for you, and we all at BCS hope that it has helped raise awareness regarding security and has shed some light on the challenges that we all face daily. Thank you for the feedback that has been received and for those that have emailed comments into us. Uh, just a small note, I'm feeling slightly under the weather today, so if I have to cut out for a few moments here and there, I've not disappeared, I'll be right back. We have a lot of new people joining us today, so I'll introduce us one last time. I'm Lee Hutton and I'm one of our senior remote engineers. I often deal with some of the fallout that occurs from security issues that get raised. Carl Tomlinson is our systems administrator and he implements and maintains security functions and features across our network. Over the last two sessions, we have spoken about what threats are being targeted to us as it, sorry, excuse me, what threats are being targeted to us as end users and how we can go about protecting ourselves and our accounts. With the unfortunate world events that are happening, I would say most of us are working from home. And this week, we're going to talk about some of the aspects that could be being overlooked regarding the safety and security of your data whilst being away from the office. You will all notice, hopefully, that there's a Q&A section on Teams and you can ask any questions. We have had some good ones so far and as normal, we will get to those at the end of the session. The topic this week is, are your home networks keeping your corporate data secure or leave it exposed? We have split these into four sections. The first section that we will cover is based around company policies, followed on by our work devices and corporate networks. We will then go on to cover some of your home devices and networks. And finally, we'll be covering the human element of working from home. A lot of cybersecurity can be based around something that's called the three pillars. They're quite easy to remember. People, process, processes and technology. So people, training and awareness, teaching people what to do, having and processes, having the right processes in place for how staff are supposed to use the equipment that they've been given, uh, what to do in the event of an incident and technologies is making sure that we've got the right tools in place and having as many layers as possible in that security uh, like onion that we were talking about over the last couple of sessions firstly we just wanted to cover off some interesting statistics that we've come across recently they don't necessarily relate uh, to remote working, but are interesting nevertheless. In the UK alone, victims lost over £800,000 to coronavirus scams in February. One unlucky person in particular was left £15,000 lighter after buying lots of face masks that never arrived. Research shows that some 4,000 COVID-19 domains have been registered this year, many likely for fronts for cybercrime. You know, as we've mentioned previously, they want to trick you into clicking on their emails. You can also buy COVID-19 infected Bosley fluids on the black market for around £850. I don't know who would want to do that, but yeah. And one third of IT decision makers admitted that their organisations had suffered a data breach as a result from right working. Khan, I'll let you take away the um, first part. Thanks, Lee. So when working from home, there are a whole host of additional complications and risks to your data that exist uh, that are not so much of a concern in the office. This isn't because the risks don't exist, um, but they're greatly reduced, primarily due to the fact that the office is under your control. You control the physical security and you or your IT team control your corporate network. You lose a lot of this control when a member of staff or their device leaves the office. Company policy is, is key here to maintaining some of that control and ensuring that ensuring the security of your data. 
After all, if your company policy doesn't state it, can an employee really be blamed for an action that led to a breach? For example, an employee uses their personal device to access their work emails. When logging into their Office 365 account on their home PC, they don't realise that they have malware on that PC. This malware then steals their login credentials. Their account is then breached and the data is stolen. Who's to blame in this instance? Naturally, you'd probably assume the employee, but if you haven't stated in your company policy that staff aren't to log into their work accounts or access work data from their personal devices, they can't really be blamed. Uh, education is also important here. If the, if the user isn't educated in the company process, then it's hard to place the blame on them. It's therefore paramount importance that, that you, if you don't already create a remote, if you don't already have one, create a remote working policy that dictates what is and what isn't acceptable. The policy should be read, understood and signed by all staff. You need to consider things such as what devices are storing your data while working remotely. Are you allowing personal devices to access your company data? How are these devices accessing your data remotely? For example, is the data stored in the cloud or are you going to use the force of the VP, uh, force the use of a VPN to access your internal documents stored on your servers? If you have ISO 27001, you should already have a remote working policy, but you need to ensure that it is kept up to date and relevant. This remote policy will help you remain compliant with any other frameworks that you work towards, such as Cyber Essentials. It's important not to let compliance slip just because you are no longer in the office. This presentation will include some of the best practices for working from home and the things that you may want to consider including in your remote working policies. Of course, a remote working policy is a preventative measure. Mobile working attracts significant risks and security incidents will occur even when users follow the policy. The question is, what do you do in the event that you are breached? You will need to review or implement an incident response plan. Incident response plans should be sufficiently flexible to deal with a range of security incidents that could occur, including the loss or compromise of a device or a hacked account. Ideally, technical processes should be in place to minimise the impact of these breaches, such as changing a password or blocking a machine's access to the corporate network. I'm just going to pass this over to Lee now, who's going to run you through um, device security. Thanks, Khan. Over the last few months, we have had many people take their machines home that are normally stored in the office. These could be desktops, laptops or even printers. We are demanding so much for more from our networks. Now many more people are working from home. There is often a blurred line into the difference between personal and business use and, and there really shouldn't. One of the downsides from people using their work machines at home may be that people could be using removable media more to move files around to different people. We would advise that this not be done. In, in fact, the USB ports can be disabled by policies and is often the best practice to do so. Not only does this stop things getting onto your system, it also stops people taking the data away from their machine. I'll give you an example. This could be as innocent as a teenager wanting to print their homework on the home printer that is connected to the work laptop. It, it may have a, a random exe file, get free road bucks, that on his pen drive that he may have taken to his friend's house before lockdown. I don't know about you, but I do know that if my children thought that they could get free road bucks, they are likely to click something. Educating children about the scariness and reality of the internet is, is not an easy task and is, is a constant battle and struggle. What actually could be on the pen drive is actually malware, it could be a virus or spyware, and could auto run once plugged into your work machine. This would then make your day so much worse. People at the office may be used to dropping files on a network share, sharing it to colleagues or go and look in that folder. Uh, their home internet connection just may not be sufficient enough to move files around. So they do use, try and use other methods to get the data about. We have, we have worked with customers recently that do not have the best of internet connections at home and this makes their working life a little bit more difficult and mainly time consuming. If you do find yourself in need to move files around to other people for whatever reason, you can always use OneDrive to, to, to move and share them about. The data is encrypted in transit and at rest on the Microsoft servers. 
with OneDrive and, and SharePoint being internet based and not email based, you can move large files around easily and more securely. Unfortunately, once the files are on your local machine, you are then relying on security measures and processes you have in place on your machine to protect the data. This could be in form of BitLocker, or you could be, uh, or if you're just using a machine, just, just normal processes in place, such as passwords, and you just need to get that data secure. Um, and you're relying on those to be in place. I would say that a lot of people don't utilize security measures in the house on their personal devices due to them just being at home and having different needs than a business does. Some people just turn their machines on, go straight to their desktop, no problem. But that's not what a business needs to do. You need to keep that data secure. You could use a VPN to connect your corporate network. Uh, this would give the user a similar experience as if they were to be in the office again, as if their machine was physically based in the office. So you would get access back to your shared drives, your your work printers uh, will, will become available again. Uh, there are other benefits to VPN, which I'll go over in a moment. <clears throat> Whilst a lot of your machines are covered by your IT providers tools, some users are using personal devices to access corporate data. Do they have anti antivirus protection? Are their firewalls turned off on their machines? Do they have secure DNS? What applications do they have installed on their machines? We, we don't know. There are so many things that are not monitored. This even includes personal mobile phones, as a lot more people are using their, their, their personal devices for checking emails, uh, just using general work data and there's no way of us knowing which apps are installed on the on the device. I mean, I'm, uh, so excuse me, I mentioned VPNs just, just a moment ago and I wanted to go through that in a little more detail. VPNs are a good solution to a lot of the problems that with work devices being used at home. It allows local, it, it allows access to local storage your printers and even lets your passwords rotate normally. It can allow secure DNS to be running on your machines. And you can even use the VPN on phones to benefit from some of these protections in, or from your corporate network. Whilst VPNs are good, the strain that this may put onto your office internet connection may be a lot for it to deal with, but it, it is depending on what you're trying to use your VPN for and how your tunnels are connected. For example, let's say that you have a maximum connection available and you live directly next to the exchange. That should give you a, a fiber speed of 80 megabits down and 20 megabits per second up. Just generally, download speed is used a lot more than upload speed. So that's why you have a higher download than you do upload. So when you're all in the office and using internet services or just day-to-day -day internet usage, 80 megabits a second is plenty to play with for multiple multiple users. A lot of your line of business applications will be running on your local network, which will normally be running a lot faster. You'll probably be hardwired in your in your local network. It will just be so much faster in, in most cases than uh, your internet connection. Whilst you're working from home and you want to get a file and and it's at work or use a business application, you're now not you're now no longer using your internal network or your download from the office. You're actually using the office's upload speed, which in the, in this scenario is 20 megabits a second. Uh, and that's best case scenario. Oftentimes it will be lower. So when you're trying to grab a file, you're now pulling data from the office. You're using your download speed but your office's upload speed. Uh, so now if the VPN is the preferred method of connection, which it is, and depending on some variables, that internet connection could be a bottleneck for you. And there are some solutions available to you. There are two types of VPN tunnels. One's called transport, uh, transparent, which is a split tunnel, or a full tunnel. The difference being that the split tunnel is only sending the traffic that needs to go to the office to the office, uh, whereas a full tunnel is sending 
all traffic to the office regardless of where you're going. There are pros and cons to both, so please, so, you know, as mentioned before, everyone's got different needs, different layers, and please email in, ask us any questions you may have on that. Let's say you don't live on top of an exchange and you've got a bad connection. There is also a service and it's called a dedicated lease line. This will give you a much faster connection, much more stable uh, and often allows you to run full tunnel VPNs much more effectively. And this means that you'll have access to your local line of business applications a lot more smoothly. On top of the VPN being the primary method of connecting to your office, you will need a better firewall solution. The firewalls that we install for customers are very advanced and they are no longer just basic firewalls anymore. They are called UTM devices. UTM stands for Unified Threat Management, meaning that you get more features and more functions in one, one package. For instance, whilst connecting to the corporate network, whether this be in the office or by VPN, I cannot download executable files or scripts, which normally come in the form of viruses. I mean, there are normal downloads, but the firewall actually monitors for these and blocks them from ever getting to me. And I'll get a page saying, you can't do this. Th these devices tend, generally tend to come with better hardware on board, so you can fully utilize better encryption methods for connecting to your local networks, uh, to your work network, sorry. Working from home does come with additional challenges that are often overlooked. The chances that your devices may be stolen or accidentally damaged now that they are not in your work environment where you have your normal protection and work, sorry, your normal computer protections and your, in your, in your workspace measures are higher. Since the lockdown was put into effect, I've spoken with people that are working in all rooms of the house, including the kitchen. People may not have dedicated workspaces, which could lead to higher accidents, such as dropping your laptop, knocking it off the table or side, sitting on it where it's been left on the sofa. Unfortunately, accidents do happen and you should talk to your staff to see what you can do to help make their environment more user friendly. Just to quickly cover stolen devices, the, the real sort of only protection from that is to make sure your devices are encrypted uh, using BitLocker. They must be bit lockered if they're leaving the office. But to be fair, bit locker is so easy to enable, it should be on all devices that uh, support it. This protects the data that's on the drive. As it's the only way, as it, the only way past it is if you know the bit locker key, or if someone was to steal the laptop and turn it on, they would have to know your passwords. And the only real way around that is to wipe the device. So but ultimately your data is secure using bit locker. And I don't know if any of you ever had to type in your BitLocker code, but it's very long. Where users are not connected to the corporate network and are not using a VPN solution, users are saving items to their desktops and their local documents, which are more than likely not being backed up. Where possible, obviously all data should be stored in a centrally backed up location, such as your network drive, SharePoint or OneDrive. Just note that SharePoint and OneDrive aren't a backup uh, solution, they are a sync solution. And we understand that this may not always po be possible. Users may be used to having their desktops and documents backed up for them so they can jump from different machines in the office and everything is there ready for them to go. As users are not really connected to the corporate network, data is likely to be stored on their desktops and documents. This is this is only locally. So if your device breaks or gets stolen, you, you're not going to have a great day trying to get that presentation you're working on up until midnight last night. Fortunately, OneDrive does offer a solution to this problem, which does come with your office license. It will sync your desktop documents and pictures to your cloud accounts, and you can also specify other folders as well to sync. And this way, if your device is stolen or damaged, 
you can easily migrate to a new machine without relying on the corporate network so much and knowing that everything is safe. <clears throat> Let's go over some of the home network uh, and some set steps you can take to minimize risk to your data. Let's start with your home router. Wireless is a big part of our everyday lives. And to be able to get connectivity to a device with no cables is, is a necessary part of our personal lives. Unfortunately, wireless is not as secure as, as, as a cable going directly to your device. There are many different Wi-Fi security methods and a lot of them are outdated and have been cracked. This means that if you are using any of these methods and your network, uh, then your network can be compromised from just sitting outside your house. There are websites dedicated to mapping wireless names where people drive around and just collect your wireless names and they will just plot them on a graph worldwide. I would go as far to say that there are more than likely bad actors scanning people's home networks trying to gain access. This could be through an exploit in their generic uh, router. They might be using a standard ISP one or possibly using weak Wi-Fi passwords or outdated encryption methods. I know this sounds a bit too for hat, but as we have mentioned over this, you know, over this series, your data is valuable. Why is it not valuable to other people that want to use it against you? You may have people that you have given your wireless key to, such as friends and family. You may have also lent your neighbour some Wi-Fi when they were having issues. Has this ever been revoked? Although some, you know, people having it is not avoidable. It's worth thinking about. It's, it's all about reducing that risk to your data. <clears throat> Let's go over a couple of small tips to secure your home network. Firstly, get that wireless key changed, especially if it's left at the default where it's stuck on the back. I know that there, there are practices out there from companies that would do something as simple as use the MAC address as your wireless SSID password. Now, I won't bore you with the technical side, but I could get your MAC address quite quickly. The wireless, the wireless key should ideally consist of 12 characters can, that contain upper and lower case numbers and special characters. Adjust your encryption methods. Ideally, we want something called WPA2 and then based off the AES encryption method. That's the only one that should be being used. And there are still so many routers out there using older styles of encryption. Not many people think to change their default password for the router. It just doesn't, it's just not natural for them to do so. So I'm guessing that some of your passwords for just, it could just be admin, admin, admin password. Get, let's get that default password changed. If possible, Put your, put your router in a central location to your house. Not only does this give a good spread of a wireless signal, it also reduces the wireless signal to the exterior of your house. Again, we were talking earlier about people sitting outside trying to break in. It just helps with the, all these layers that we talk about. You must ensure that the firewall is enabled on your router. Although this is likely to be on, I have seen some connections where someone's tried to help them enable a port forward they couldn't get it to work and they've just turned the firewall off completely. Then you're relying on your Windows firewall to protect you and I, I wouldn't want to just rely on that. Do you have any open ports on your firewall? How many ports do you have open and are you aware of them? Maybe maybe it, you might not even know. Maybe it was a maybe a child was trying to create potentially a Minecraft server at home and other people connect to it from outside. Maybe that isn't password protected. Maybe people just come in. Uh, is this something that is happening? Does it still need to happen? These are questions that we should be thinking about. And if your router does have an admin control panel from the external, make sure this is turned off. Continuing on with some settings, you could go a step further and see which devices are already connected to your network. Without going in too deep on the technical side, your home device is likely to, to your home router is likely to control your DHCP scope. 
like we mentioned in, in a previous episode. DNS is like the phone book or yellow pages for your IP addresses, so it knows where to go. But DHCP is what actually gives those addresses in the first place. There should be a list of DHCP addresses that have been given out. These can be seen by logging onto your router and you want to be searching for something like connected devices and you might have a list by wire and wireless. You should be able to identify all these devices. If not, we should probably look into what they are and what they're doing on your network. This could be devices such as laptops, computers, skyboxes, tablets, wireless lights, other internet of things devices, your nest. You should uh, be able to add Sorry. Lee, sorry, I was, I was going to say, I just want to jump in here and, and just, just point out that it's actually relatively easy to, to view the list of devices on your network. Um, I know we're talking about DHCP and sort of the technical side of it, but um, I know in particular with the Home Hub, um, you can log on to that. And literally, I think it's the first screen when you log on to the admin portal, um, which if you haven't changed the details are on the back of the router, you can, you're literally presented with a list of of cabled and wireless devices so it's really really easy if you ever do just want to see out of interest your know, curiosity and sort of audit what's connected to your network it's nice and easy to do you literally just browse to to your router um, again the details should be on the back if you haven't changed them we recommend you do change them um, but if you haven't done that that's a starting point and it's nice and easy just to, to check over it just to check for any sort of rogue devices if you have never changed a password sorry no no it's all good Carl. thanks Where was I? Oh, yeah. Uh, if you have guest access available on your router, you should enable it. Connect any devices that just need an internet connection to it. This means your children's Wi Fi devices, smart appliances, Internet of Things devices, and just general, just things that just need an internet connection. Put it on a guest network. This would reduce the threat to your normal work device, even on your home network. It, it effectively VLANs. Uh, it's, a, it's a very basic VLAN functionality. Uh, a VLAN is, is, is a virtual network and it just separates off from your main network. Protecting your home network has now become ever more important. All the devices should have sufficient antivirus protection. There may be free products out there, uh, but for the best protection, it's worth asking your IT provider to place these extra devices on support. Do your IT, does your IT provider know that you've got other devices that are connecting to the corporate network? These are things that we should be thinking about. It's ideal to monitor what applications are being installed on all your devices, but children's devices, their tablets. I know, I know in our house applications cannot be installed by the children, but they are locked out from installing anything. So they have to come to us as parents for permission and then we'll look at it, see if it's appropriate. I'm sure many of you know, there's so many applications out there, small apps that are made by bad people, and it's not a sort of thing you want to be spying on your network. <clears throat> are there additional devices on your home network causing you to be more vulnerable to risks? This could be machines such as XP, Windows XP, Windows Vista, or Windows 7. I'm sure you have all heard and remember the worm WannaCry that literally rampaged through the NHS's network and effectively bricking their machines and servers. I'm sure you all remember reading about that, listening to that in the news. Uh, this was ultimately targeted at Windows XP, but as Windows 7 is no longer, no longer supported, it's only a matter of time until something like this happens to, to Windows 7. I mentioned Internet of Things devices a moment ago, but they have some of the worst security possible and, and worst practices. There have very, very recently been laws passed, uh, mainly in the US, but it does affect us worldwide, that anything that has a default password has to have a unique password. Uh, and that's, I mean, there, sometimes there won't even be passwords for Internet of Things devices. Uh, companies do vary in the way that they are implementing this. And it is a relatively new law, but there are millions of devices out there that are just completely insecure. They're just sat on your network. Thanks, Lee. 
Um, just something else we wanted to cover off. It's not really a, a security issue, but it, but it will or it can massively impact your experience working from home. Um, it is your internet speed. Um, again, it's not security related, but it's something we felt we should we should cover off just for the sort of best working from home experience. Really, um, I highly doubt anyone still uses dial up, but there still are quite a few people out there who use ADSL and not fiber connections. Uh, ADSL's major limitation is, is the further you are from the exchange, the slower your internet connection will be and, and even less stable. This affects fiber as well, but to a lesser extent. Um, we've worked on a connection recently and they had something like 0.9 megabits per second down and 0.25 megabits per second up. That's very slow. You're not going to get much done on that. Um, <laughs> and especially with more people now utilizing video calls uh, to communicate with colleagues and even family, friends and family, you know, bandwidth's never been so important from home. Um, it, so now is probably the time to upgrade. If you haven't got a fiber connection and you are having issues with, with internet speeds, definitely look into a fiber connection. You may even find um, it's not any more, any more expensive. Um, some fiber connections, depending on who you're with, um, but you may find the upgrade is, is, is not quite as much as you're expecting. Um, if you're trying to use video conferencing, um, it may be worth trying to having a look as well because I know from experience I've had issues in the house with people streaming uh, video. I was unfortunate enough to start working from home around about the time as most of us were when Disney Plus was released and a lot of the content on Disney Plus is, is 4K so you know really high quality but it absolutely hammers your internet. Um, streaming and even games consoles. If you've got games console, I've, I've had this as well in my house. It updates a game. You might get like a 100 gigabyte update to a game come through and all of a sudden that's maxing out your bandwidth updating this and you can't get anything done. So you do need to be careful with that, particularly during your business hours. If you've got an important conference coming up, you want to make sure the internet's relatively clear. It doesn't mean other people can't use it, but they probably have to be mindful about what they're doing on it, especially if you are on the on the lower end of the bandwidth side. Um, to give you an idea, Netflix, the, an average 4K stream on Netflix is about uses about 16 megabits per second. 1080p, so HD, uses 6.9 megabits per second. So as you can see, if you're using, if you've got 20 megabits per second down, and someone's watching Netflix at 4K, that leaves you with with roughly four megabits per second down. Um, you know that you're not going to get too much done with that, especially if you've got other people using it as well. It doesn't leave much, much room for for anything else. So just just bear that in mind. And then finally, we just wanted to cover off some of the human based side of the security. So going back to the three pillars, people being one of them. Um, as covered off in our first session two weeks ago, phishing attacks have, have increased since the onset of COVID-19. Hackers are adapting quickly to take advantage of the unfamiliar scenario we, we currently find ourselves in. Before COVID-19, phishing was already the biggest cyber threat to a company. Uh, this no doubt has increased significantly since. Uh, Google actually announced that and, and he's, we, we, these stats we actually quoted in the, in the first presentation, but it's worth repeating. Uh, Google announced that their Gmail service had been used to send 18 million COVID-19 related phishing emails per day. 18 million. They're able to block some of them, but the point is, this is, you know, that's probably increased since then. Um, and they also noticed, and that's just Gmail, bearing in mind, they actually noticed 240 million COVID related spam emails coming into their user base. So if you've got a Gmail account, you're one of those users, and Gmail wide, all their mailboxes, they actually identified 240 million COVID related spam emails per day. Um, that sort of gives you an idea of the enormity of of the risk. I can't I can't remember the exact um, I can't remember the exact uh, percentage, but I think something like 80, 85 percent of the email traffic in the whole world is something like spam or something like that. I remember it being an astronomically large number. Yeah, and I think one in five emails uh, that's got a header on is spam as well. So just because it looks like it's from the World Health held the World Health Organization doesn't mean it is just just be careful of things like that that was one of the examples we showed actually um was an email from the world Health appearing to be from the who um and it wasn't it was an email you click on the next door money out of you um 
but but yeah, spam filters are key to blocking a large quantity of these emails. Um, but but what about when emails do inevitably slip through? End user training, as we've mentioned, but it's worth repeating, is a vital step you can take towards securing your data. It's never been more true than in the year of COVID-19 when they're remote working. Users should be trained on how to identify a phishing email, how to act if they receive a phishing email, and what to do in the event they have clicked on a phishing email. You can carry out simulated phishing attacks across your company to see which members of staff are more vulnerable to clicking on malicious links. You can provide targeted training or extra training for them. The training doesn't just stop at phishing, however. There are other aspects to consider, including the fact that your staff are most likely using software they haven't had to use before, or at least reply, re rely upon so heavily, such as video conferencing tools, such as Teams or Zoom. I know we use Teams. We've used it in the office for quite a while now, but we didn't use it half as much as we do now. Nowhere near. Um, and that, that, that brings with it a certain un uncertainty. Users don't quite know what the tool does. Um, so that's why you want to provide guidance on how to use these tools efficiently and securely. Users should be trained to control the impulse to improvise. So but I mean, if a user's using a bit of software, in particular software they're not too familiar with, such as Teams, and it isn't quite working, we've seen it before where users may go off and, and they might try and source another bit of software. They might use a bit of software, you know, in their personal day to day life, Skype personal, for example. Um, they may decide to use that because that's easier for them. They don't have to learn Teams and they know how Skype personal works. But the problem with that is that data that they're sharing over that, that platform isn't under the company's control. You don't know what they're sharing over that. You don't have any control to it over there. If one of them gets a breach, you don't have this central admin capabilities you do over something like Teams where it's centrally controlled. So if you need to get on top of or track a breach, you can't do that with a personal bit of software. Um, so, so basically users need to know that it isn't acceptable to go and download and install non-approved software as an alternative. But this goes over to those processes. Exactly, we it comes back to that. Yeah, de definitely. And you're given uh, a set of software that you use. You're provided by it's essentially like a toolkit by the company, Teams, Office, I don't know, Sage, whatever it is. You're given those tools for a reason. They're licensed, they're secure, and they're centrally controlled. So they really, really need to know in this in this era of the uncertainty with the software that impulse needs to be controlled. And again, that comes down to training to know that they can't go off and policy to say that they can't go and install, you know, other third party business software. Um, it would lead to, it can lead to data leakage um, and leave your machine vulnerable to malware, especially if they're installing, you know, free video conferencing.com, that sort of stuff. Uh, the user should know basically to seek assistance from their IT department if they experience any difficulties with a company issued software. Then there is training around using the PC at home. Uh, um, but I don't mean how to load Outlook or send an email, you know, the basic day to day of their job, but it's a different environment. Um, and you should have a policy in place anyway that says users shouldn't leave their laptop or PC unlocked when in the office. That's even more important when outside of the office. So the user should know not to leave the laptop unlocked while unattended. Um, if the user has to leave the laptop for any reason, the screen should be locked. It not only protects against malicious access to data, I'm not saying anyone in your house is going to be doing stuff maliciously, but this is remote working as a whole. But something that is probably more applicable to your house is it also stops your child come along and, you know, hitting the keyboard and accidentally deleting some important work. I know my children, they'll come up and they'll want to see what I'm doing on, on the laptop. And sometimes I have to stop them from hitting the keyboard when I'm on it. So God knows what they're going to do when I'm not on it. <laughs> I forget like the dogs and cats. <laughs> that's it when they're walking across the keyboard you don't know if they're going to delete something and you probably won't even know it's been deleted um so you definitely want to avoid that by locking the uh locking the screen and also you don't want to write down passwords that's just the other one again that applies in the office but again that's even more important outside of the office you don't want someone to be able to read your password off of a sticky note Another small bit of, uh, but important bit of advice around keeping your device safe uh, is, is from theft and damage. Um, so when you're training a user, you want to you, you want to provide some basic training. So a lot of it's common sense, but if it isn't said again, can they be blamed? Don't leave your laptop near an open window. If the laptop's, you know, some houses 
go right up onto the street. If you've got an open window, someone's only got to reach in and pull the laptop out. So it's common sense stuff like that. But again, if you've covered it, you've covered, you know, you've covered yourself and then it's down to the user. They've had the training not to do it. Um, again, don't leave the laptop. I know as example Lee gave earlier, balancing on the edge of a kitchen countertop where it can be knocked off. Or even if it's in the kitchen, it could become water damaged. So these other, other um, scenarios that, you, you know, may not happen, but they're more likely to happen that can happen outside of the office that and that's the point yeah definitely so as mentioned at the beginning of the presentation uh, in the event a laptop is stolen or damaged or an account is breached the user needs to know what to do um who they should contact how quickly and then someone needs to know what steps need to be taken so that might be their contact uh, this will be dictated by your company policy um the company policy may say to contact your line manager and IT support and IT support will lock down your account and, and the line manager would deal with the sort of legalities of it if any data has gone missing and things like that. Uh, the risk to your data isn't just cyber related. There's a large, large risk of confidential information being leaked via an overheard conversation or being overlooked. The user should be trained to identify these risks and act accordingly, such as position themselves uh, with their back to, back to a wall. Uh, Lee laughed when I put that one in. It seems quite extreme. But uh, especially if you're in a public place, um, again, at home, it depends what the nature of your business is. But there will be some confidential yeah. stuff. 100%. Sorry. No, no, I'm just saying 100%. It's, uh, it, it, it does seem funny, but if people can overhear you talking about multi-million pound deals, I don't know. De de definitely. That's information um, you don't want out there. No, that's it. And, and, you know, even, even family, I'm sure there's something in your contract that you can't disclose certain stuff. So you're disclosing it you know so you do need to bear that in mind so so maybe have the laptop you know you're sitting against the wall um and also if you have to take a call and you think it's going to be confidential it's uh, you know leaving the room before discussing confidential information out loud again that comes down to training and it comes down to the policies um the policies dictate what to do the training is how to follow those policies basically so it all sort of loops around uh, finally on training, uh, we would recommend that users don't mix personal and work. So if possible, users should use their devices for work and their, per uh, their sorry, their work devices for work and their personal devices for personal matters. If you keep the two worlds separate like this, you're taking a big step towards reducing the risk to your data. Um, unless your personal devices are managed by your IT department, there's no, there's no guarantee, there's no guarantee anyway, but there's no, you know, you can't say of any degree of certainty that those devices are secure. You don't know whether they've got up-to-date AV on them. You know, you don't know whether they're riddled with malware. Um, just if you can, keep your work stuff to your work devices and your personal stuff to your personal devices. And then now we discuss training. We just want to cover off a few more steps you can take to minimise risk when talking about the human side of security. So again, going back to the pillars, people. Um, in particular, communication. Um, we would suggest keeping close contact with your, with your employer, if you're an employee, employee, or your employees, if you're an employer. Uh, this is really, really important. Communication working remotely is even more important than when you're all working from the same office. Um, ask a colleague if you're stuck. It's not quite as easy as being sat next to them, but you should still take the time to call for help. Lockdown doesn't mean you're alone. You might be isolated, but you know, you've got the tools there to help communication. And this one's important. Employees should be kept up to date with the goings on in the business and have regular check-ins with their line manager. It goes back to the initial point we made around phishing. The user is less likely to act on a spear phishing email if they know where the business is heading. Again, none of us have experienced a situation like COVID-19 and hackers are looking to exploit the uncertainty. Communication and regular check-ins can help defeat that. There is no uncertainty. If, if, you, if it's good communication from the top to the bottom, you know, throughout the throughout the company, um, there's no sort of you're more likely to know when something's out of the ordinary. If there's no communication, all of a sudden you get an email from your CEO saying we're doing this, you might not question it because it's been a couple of months since you had an update and you were expecting an update. So regular check ins, regular updates, and you're more likely to, to notice a, a buck in the trend. If something comes in, it's slightly unnormal to your weekly check in, for example, maybe a daily check in. but you're more likely to spot that and also it's important to consider the mental health of a remote engineer, uh, remote worker um, especially if they're living alone or under lockdown or and under lockdown 
um, set, set up team calls throughout the day, call colleagues and organize the remote team building exercises to keep your spirits up. A user is less likely to cause a, a security breach if they're in the right frame of mind and are motivated. So I'm just going to pass you back over to Lee to conclude. Cool, thanks Khan. Uh, just to, to conclude, um, it's really important to have policies in place to protect your business. As Khan mentioned, get the policies in place and then train the people. Everyone will do a much better sort of job if they know exactly what to do when they need to do it. Uh, these these are instant response plans, acceptable use policies, password policies. There, there are actually many, many policies available that cover many aspects of an IT uh, and BCS are here if you, you need help. Um, get your devices secured, personal ones now and always. Actually, hopefully going over today's topics have sort of showed light that people just turn their devices on and just use them. They might not worry about certain bits and pieces. Maybe it's time to think about some more security awareness around those. As Carl mentioned, let's not use um, personal devices for business use where you know where possible. And if you need to, let's make sure that they've got the right security measures in place. Let's get your home network secured. Wireless needs strengthening because that probably will be the biggest weakness of your home network. And um, again, training is key for all users. And lastly, as Carl mentioned, communication is so vital. It's completely different times we're in. Although some people might like the working from home and some businesses might not go back to offices, they might actually not not find it too bad working from home. There are other, you know, on the other side of it, there are people that do struggle working from home and it's probably key to recognize that and make sure you're on top of that. Um, just before we get into any questions, I'd like to thank you all um, for being in these sessions with us. Uh, some of you have been here every week. And if you require any of these recordings, please email us at education at bcs365.co.uk. I do suggest you do so, so you can share it around your staff. There was, um, I'd like to say myself, there were some good topics and uh, definitely some interesting sort of thoughts. Uh, it's, just, it's just to help get the security. I mean, I only mentioned it once this time, but again, security is about layering. Uh, let's just let's have many things in place so that if something fails, there should hopefully be something else there to catch something that may have gone wrong definitely and so if, if anyone has any questions just pop them in the q a field in teams and, and we'll get we'll get we'll get around to them and, and do our best to answer them um so we got a question here just around backups um we currently have a backup every day but i feel a day backup is no longer enough um, a lot can change in a day what increments um do you use on some of your clients? So, our backups. It, it depends on it depends on the server, really. Um, if you're talking about a remote server, um, no data changes on a day is probably sufficient. But if you've got a server where data is changing by the minute, um, you can get backup software. Um, we use a product called Storagecraft, and that runs every 15 minutes. Um, so you can restore that back to 15 minutes ago. So in the event you deleted a file or you don't have to restore back to the previous day, you can go back to 15 minutes ago. Um, we'd recommend you have three copies of a backup as well. So you've got the three, two, one backups, um, three copies of the backup. You've got two different mediums and one offsite. Um, two different mediums could be an external hard drive or queuing out, for example, free copies and then your one off site. So you've got a cloud service or something like that. So it's just all extra. Again, it's all layers, it's extra security. Oh, I've got another question about cyber essentials. Um, this person says they've seen cyber essentials a lot recently. Um, and yes, it is a very well known acc accreditation. And uh, how much does it cost? Uh, so it, it costs about 300 pounds um I, I believe for the submission of the form and basically you work through this form to ensure your sort of compliance with with the framework so you've got questions around patching user accounts that sort of stuff your firewalls 
do you have all this all, all these um back to finding those policies we were talking about exactly yeah, it all comes back to that yeah sure that they all interlink and um you can't actually do business with some companies now, in particular government organisations, if you don't have Cyber Essentials. So there's two Cyber, you've got Cyber Essentials and you've got Cyber Essentials Plus. Cyber Essentials is the basic, um, you know, tick box exercise. Do you meet all this stuff? Um, plus is another level. So you do the same form, but then someone comes out to your office and audits you to sort of call you out on it, basically to check you've been telling the truth on the forms. They do ask for some form of it from evidence when you do it. Um, so they want to see about policies and stuff like that. Um, but but plus, if you're really serious, is is definitely uh, definitely the way to go. Um, Lee, we've got one here about ISO twenty seven thousand one, um, and it mentions about having a data owner role within the business. Um, are you able to to answer what the data owner's responsibilities would be? Yeah, sure. Uh, the main responsibilities, the, the, sorry, the data owner's main responsibilities would be sort of working out who has access to the data, uh, what levels of data they are provided. Can, it's, uh, sort of going on about permissions, I think we, we spoke about last week about making sure the right people have the access to the right data, uh, whether they can edit, read or delete data. And, um, and and they're also in control of how these people have access to the data uh, and how it's used. Uh, this 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 allows the. <coughs> sorry. This this allows the the data owner to sort of put policies in place and procedures to help. Yes, yeah, so it's, um, but yeah, I'll help Lee out here because he mentioned he's not very well. So yeah, it helps you to create and, uh, and enforce the policies, policies and procedures. Again, come out to policies uh, to minimise the risks. Oh, sorry about that, Khan. Thank you very much. <laughs> no problem at all. <clears throat> sorry, yeah, I think you covered off that last point there. Yeah. Being that uh, it just, yeah, it's basically about making sure that people have got access to the data they need and being able yeah. to work on that. And not only the data they need. Uh, ultimately, the data owner is responsible for that data. Um, so we've got on here, there's a lot of security. Um, how would you recommend <clears throat> we start the journey? Um, we would recommend if, you, if you're just starting out your security journey, um, you want to align to a framework such as Cyber Essentials is probably the easiest one, or you've got ISO standards, which are internationally recognized. Um, it's to do with, with, with information security. Um, it's a lot more work than Cyber Essentials. If you're really, really serious about doing it, you'll want ISO. Again, it's recognizable by everyone, but Cyber Essentials at an, at an absolute at an absolute minimum, we would recommend. And any other questions? Of course, if, if anyone is interested in Cyber Essentials, you can always get in contact with us um, on the email below, education at bcsresus5.co.uk. And we can we can give you a hand with that. Yeah, we're here to help. Don't don't bury your head in the sand. Right. Let's get the ball rolling. If you need any help with any kind of procedures or policies or you know best practices, get in contact. We're here to help. Well, there's no more questions coming in, so I think we'll uh, we'll end it there. Um, so if anyone's got any any feedback. Um, or if they've got any ideas of sort of stuff they want to see in the future, you can just email us at feedback at bcs365.co.uk. And then, uh, yeah, thank you for joining us on these three and hope to see you again soon.